What's up, guys? Welcome to another edition of Josh Talks. I'm Josh Tariff. Joining me this week, you see him on NWA Power. You see him on Championship Wrestling from Hollywood. He is the mastermind of the United Wrestling <laughs> One of the most knowledgeable men that I know in wrestling. It's David Marquez. Thank you for being here, sir. Thank you for having me, Josh. Yeah, it's good, it's good to catch up with you in the midst of all the craziness that, of course, is, is going on in the world right now. Um, out of curiosity, since you obviously run various promotions all around really the country with the United Wrestling Network, in this case with a pandemic going on, how does, a, from a promoter's perspective, how does one keep content available um, each week for viewers? Well, it's tough because we're a television uh, company first and foremost, so uh, as much as we want to produce new stuff, we just can't. So we have a with Hollywood. Hollywood's been on the air for ten years, believe it or not. It's been a yeah, decade. I know. So there's close to 500 hours of that stuff. Um, and this being an anniversary year, uh, it's okay to go back and dig deep and pull stuff out um, from the past. Uh, so originally, uh, when we heard that we were not going to be able to shoot new shows, and before the idea of you know doing things without an audience and you know, originally they said you could have 10 people in a room and spread them apart or, or have every people six feet apart or whatever the deal was uh, early on. Our theater could accommodate that. So we took that into consideration, but then we thought about it, talking to the cast, talking to the crew and everybody said, well, why don't we just kick back? So what we did was we went back 10 weeks, 15 weeks uh, from where we ended and we're retelling the whole thing in reruns, which for, in the show's existence we hadn't really reran anything. So uh, it's been a fresh show, 52 weeks for 10 years. And um, uh, so it's tough. Same thing with our Arizona program, the Championship Wrestling from Arizona. Uh, it's been on the air for several years. So there's a bank of shows. Um, so that's how we're doing it. And now going into social media in uh, creating content like this um, uh, from the United Wrestling Network. So uh, I even have a show like this now, surprisingly enough. Uh, huh? they, they've dubbed it the Marquez mentality. So I'm <laughs> sure, I, I'm not sure if that's a good or bad thing, but, um, uh, Tuesdays at seven every week live on Facebook across the United wrestling network channels, uh, I'll have guests. So, um, uh, it's going to be interesting for me. Uh, then there's another show on Thursday nights, uh, which, uh, uh, they're calling the push. And if anybody knows me, they know I don't like to necessarily use wrestling terminology, but I guess that's what you have to do these days to be hip. So we have the push, which Nick Bonanno uh, host or co-host um, with people. And then we'll have our talent on there featured uh, uh, to talk about what's going on and their history with us and, and their aspirations and whatnot. So um, it's difficult, but yet it isn't. But we're still feeding over 132 TV stations across the country every week. Right. Yeah, because obviously you 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 have these audiences, you have these contracts with these networks that you have to produce the content. And in your case, in the midst of producing all the content, now you're also with NWA Power. You're also like more prominently featured on camera as well, doing the interviews and and the ring announcing. Ever since I've known you, which is well, probably getting close to 15 years at this point. Yeah, it's been a while. I've known you have been aligned in some fashion with the NWA. How did that all come about way back when, you know, when you when first really got started and everything? Well, believe it or not, I've been in wrestling now for 30 years. So, um, going way back. But well, you're only like 31, right? I what's don't that? You're only like 31 years old. I don't That's right. I'm only 31. <laughs> <laughs> been around for a cup of coffee there you go um but uh so in the mid 90s uh i had done a lot of freelance work uh worked in television all over the country in news um sports production um but i ended up in springfield missouri in the mid 90s and uh working at a tv station and the opportunity came up to produce a local show uh any type of show and i thought well why don't we do a wrestling show um, not that I necessarily knew what I was doing, uh, but I went ahead and figured out how to put together a local studio television show. Um, and in doing it, 
uh, being in Missouri, uh, referee Nick Badano. Um, in, in, <laughs> he wrote it. Because <laughs> I don't know if a lot of people know this or not. Uh, the house, there are two uh, homes here. And um, uh, it's all production. I don't have an office. This is the office. So edit bays, story meetings, you name it, it's here. <laughs> Even a makeshift gym in the back now. Uh, but uh, uh, I got hooked up with Carl Lauer, who a lot of people know uh, from the Cauliflower Alley Club. He was the executive vice president for many years. He's retired since. Um, he was in Rolla, Missouri, and he had a license to run the state. Um, and through his relationships, uh, I uh, was uh, introduced to Gordon Soley um, with the Cauliflower Alley. I think he was on the board at that time. Um, and then I made my own relationship with Harley Race, uh, being in Missouri, and brought Harley in to do some things. And uh, at that point, uh, uh, Dennis Carluzzo and Howard Brody, who were the president and vice president of the NWA in the 90s, um, they appeared on Monday Night Raw with Jim Cornette, and the NWA world title. <clears throat> and if anybody remembers, the NWA was featured on the WWF programming for a while. Yeah. That created a really big uh, opportunity for a lot of regional promoters um, to be back with something that's on a larger scale. And since uh, Cornette was pushing it on WWF TV and Jeff Jarrett was the North American champion on TV and Dan Severn was the world champion on TV, and I believe the Midnight, the new Midnight Express were the World Tag Team Champions. They even defended them out of WrestleMania. Um, that, to us, there was value to that. Mm -hmm. So Gordon Soley, uh, not Harley. Harley wasn't really for it, but Gordon Soley was. And I didn't want to disappoint Gordon. And so we became a member uh, in Missouri for the NWA um, in the 90s. Um, that meant I had to make a deal with a man who became a very good friend of mine later, Ed Schumann in Chicago, because um, the Missouri Territory was a part of his Midwest Territory, so I had to buy it off him, all this stuff. Um, but that's how it started way back then. Um, and uh, here we are 20 plus 24 years later, 25 years later, and it's back. So I've been a promoter. I've been an owner. Uh, I was sued. I lost it. Got it back. Imagine that. <laughs> <laughs> well, so what kind of learning experiences over this time, you know, with the NWA, did you really grasp to then process and create the United Wrestling Network? Well, once we lost the rights to use the NWA name, um, I felt, and I think I was a little naive, to be very honest with you even having all that uh, experience uh, going up until, I think we lost it in 2011, I think. Um, and right after that, I was like, well, all these guys that I know, we were we had a lot of momentum from uh, the KDOC TV show, uh, championship, NWA Championship Wrestling from Hollywood. Um, and the people we were featuring on that program and the biggest thing to come out of that was Colt Cabana versus Adam Pearce in the Seven Levels of Hate, yes. which got international acclaim. In putting that together, even the title tournament before that, if you see everybody who was in the world title tournament that we call Reclaiming the Glory, it's a who's who of who's in major corporate wrestling today. Um, we, we picked the right guys. Uh, so in losing it, I felt that I should be able to still work with all these promoters that helped put all that together. Um, a lot of people were not interested because they had already got out of a bad deal um, with the NWA and legal cost. And, oh, it was, it was a mess. Um, so then I learned about new promoters, people who are not from my generation. Uh, and I invited them in onto this new United Wrestling Network idea. And I just didn't take into consideration that everybody didn't have the same aptitude as me. And I'm not trying to be egotistical. Yeah. It's just facts. Mm -hmm. So I felt that anyone can make a TV show and anyone can get it on the air and anyone would want to be a part of a cooperative and share IP and work together to a, for a common goal. What I've never really taken into account and I don't even want to say it's my age, maybe it is, is 
I don't really understand social media and internet wrestling. I really don't get it. So until recently, to be honest with you. So regional wrestling companies, uh, they don't necessarily need a national narrative. They don't need to have a world championship with a champion who travels Mm -hmm. and invest in that individual because in reality, whoever wrestler A is here in Los Angeles area, Southern California, there's probably 500 of those guys all over the country sprinkled. Mm -hmm. We might not know about them because it's not a big market or the show's not very large. Uh, But, you know, in reality, there's not, there's not too many diamonds. Right. So, uh, a lot of them didn't understand the idea of what the United Wrestling Network in theory was supposed to be. Um, and since I wanted them all to make television, they put it all back on me. And I can't do it for everybody. I don't live there. I yeah. could help secure stations. I could help secure talent. I could help secure insurance. I could help secure all the business pieces. But the actual physical putting it together and doing it, I can't do. You, the, the individual has to do that. And I think that's where the slip came with the cooperative or sanctioning idea. Now what the United Wrestling Network is, is we're redeveloping that sanctioning idea with modern thinking, not 1940s thinking, and uh, really making the brand United Wrestling Network more about the television exposure that we have with the Hollywood program. And... uh, the Tiffany at the top of the, the show, if you watch it, uh, it says the following is the presentation of the United Wrestling Network. We're trying to get that into the minds of not just wrestling fans, that that's a brand, but television programmers, too. So at the end of a, of a sitcom or whatever, you'll see who produced the show. Well, I want television programmers to understand that we're a production company as well. So that's part of the reason why we use the word network, because it has to do with our unwired television network across the country. Um, So there's a little bit of data in there that most people are not even thinking about, I'm sure. Um, But, uh, but yeah, so that's the United Wrestling Network today. And with, with the network, because obviously there are wrestling organizations, as we said, all across the country, some of which are already fairly known prior to joining and being a part of the United Wrestling Network. Uh, Recently, one of the companies, there was some news on it that is part of the United Wrestling Network in Combat Zone Wrestling. Sure. Uh, where there was um, recent comments made by uh, uh, wrestler Lufisto mm-hmm. with what the company was producing and what they're titling it, making it feel demeaning towards women. Sure. Being that it's under the United Wrestling Network umbrella, was this anything that you were notified of ahead of time, or did you just kind of find out about it when Lufisto made her remarks? I found out about it when the when words started coming out and people started talking about it online. Mm-hmm. Um, but I knew of the deal beforehand. Mm-hmm. So this is the first time you have a scoop. Uh, this is the first time any of this is going to be said publicly because I don't All give right. a fuck. Um, <laughs> uh, I didn't make the deal. They did. Uh-huh. Uh, they do have a third party distribution deal. The guy's name is Steve Carroll. Okay. I can't remember the name of the production company. Mm-hmm. Steve Carroll has been around a long time. He used to distribute and finance ECW. He's done lots of in-between stuff. He's been around. Mm-hmm. Um, what Steve has done, he's the one who, he has the rights to create compilations. That's the deal. Okay. He licenses the footage. He can do what he wants on these titles. Um, and part of the agreement is he can use the CZW name as he wishes. He's paid for that. Now, I wish... DJ would have been a little more uh, aggressive in being a part of the title selection of these things. But how is he supposed to know? And I'm not protecting him either, by the way. Mm -hmm. How is he supposed to know what's supposed to happen or what's coming out? Because he's not producing those. It's when they air. It's when they go on. And some of those titles could be 60 days in advance by the time they get to the cable operator and it gets put into the TV guides and all that. I've had many conversations with DJ. And mind you, DJ's made a lot of bad decisions, and he'll tell you that. Um, he doesn't always, I, I don't want to say do the right thing, because he does do the right thing eventually. It just, and 
he has to get there. Mm -hmm. um, and as far as I know, there's releases on all the model images on all the, the all of everybody, males and females. Uh, the shows that I attended at CZW, I saw people signing waivers and releases of their image and this and that. We all do that. Um, and uh, and they did sign away that particular match. They don't own that match. CZW owns that match. They've licensed it to a third party and they put a lewd title on it. And that's unfortunate. Horrible. One thousand percent. And DJ's acknowledge that, too, publicly as well. But. I just don't feel DJ has been aggressive enough in, in giving that message. How, I mean, as someone who's, you know, behind United Wrestling Network, does anything then happen at all with the relationship with Combat Zone Wrestling? Or, no, it's just I, don't, I mean, I don't, at the moment, there is no Combat Zone Wrestling. Oh, well, sure. Um, so, uh, uh, I, I can't, I, I, I can't, I put it this, I come from a generation where you let it play out. Mm hmm I, I don't just say, oh, shit, that happened. This guy's bad. He's evil. Oh, my God. Right. No, I don't come from that world. So I'm going to let it play out and see what happens. Um, if DJ does not have the proper paperwork like he says he does, well, then you take that into account. Um, if he's lying and he knew about it the entire time and it, that comes out, well, then you make your decision at that point. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not into assassinating people because I understand how things work. Uh, and it's not just like, oh, this is wrestling. This isn't any type of entertainment or any type of business. You know, if you could be a contractor, you can be a plumber, you can be anything and something goes bad, something you didn't agree to or something horrible happens, whatever that death, whatever. But you don't just all of, all of a sudden just ah, jump on someone. You let it play out. And let's see if this goes into legal. Um, I'm not challenging anyone, but I've also not heard anyone who has been complaining has filed any charges or has put any suits against them. I can be completely wrong because again, it's not my company. Right. We're associated, but I don't know their day-to-day -day business. I do know about this deal though. Let's let's try to switch to some some lighter stuff. Okay. In 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 the back, I I I am seeing some Mickey Mouse stuff behind you because I know you like way back in the corner of Bookshelf, it looks like there's a Mickey Mouse of some kind. Yeah, there's there's, there's <laughs> stuff back there. You're seeing, you're seeing an you're seeing an Oswald. Ah. Oh. <laughs> but no, but there's Mickey up above, yeah. Okay. Because I mean, I know you, you know, in the past you you worked for Disney, you love Disney. There are so many people in the wrestling business that are just obsessed with Disney, or maybe obsessed with Marvel, or obsessed with comic books. You know, like you seeing like the world of of the imagination um, with everything. And I feel like there's more of that in the wrestling business than any other type of perform, uh, performance. Why do you think that is? Uh, I don't know if that's necessarily true. Um, uh, di 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 so I'll correct one thing here. Please. I do not love Disney. <laughs> I don't. I am a big fan of Roy and Walt Disney. Okay. Um, when people ask me, what's your favorite Disney film? I always tell them it's tough because for me, Disney films end in 1967, 1968. Uh, Walt Disney Productions or Walt Disney Pictures or Touchstone or Miramax or Marvel or Pixar, that's not Disney to me. Mm -hmm. uh, the 10 feature films, animated feature films that Walt Disney made himself, that's what I consider Disney, if you want to go that route. Sure. I'm a fan of Follow Me Boys, a Fred McMurray film that no one knows. Mm -hmm. Um the one and only original family band with Walter Brenna and uh, Buddy Epson and, uh, and Kurt Russell and, and uh, Goldie Hawn met on that set. You know, I like Disney's Babes in Toyland. Uh, oh, yeah. Of course, yeah. of course, the ultimate masterpiece of Mary Poppins. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, when it comes to Disney, there's so many segments of it. And being, you know, born and raised in Southern California and having access to Disneyland, although it's not like it is now where you, it's a mall and you just show up at your annual pass and walk in. When I was a kid, you know, you had to pay an admission. And if you wanted to ride anything, you had to buy coupons, tickets. Mm -hmm. So everything had an admission, just like a fair on top of the general admission. So you really didn't get to see much um, unless you were super loaded. And if you were a family of four or five, there's no way you got to see everything because there, it was expensive. Sure. Um, in, my, in today's term, 
you know, two dollars or four dollars or whatever is for to ride one ride. Imagine that spending four dollars just to get on Space Mountain today, which yeah. would probably be twenty five dollars or something. Um, so being around that as a kid, seeing Walt Disney on television, although he was he was already dead for. 66 he died in 66 so let's say by the time i started realizing images and things in 19 says let's say eight nine years after walt's death he was still on television his show was still on tv and it was he was still in color mm -hmm. so you know to me he wasn't dead and to a lot of people it was the same thing so i was seeing stuff from the late 50s all through the 60s of him at the world's fair or him playing with audio animatronics or this is the plausible impossible in animation. And that pushed me to want to be an animator. That's what I originally wanted to do. I wanted to make cartoons. Mm -hmm. um, so to answer your question, I think Disney is one of the most universal things uh, that is uh, nostalgic things. So you might remember the first time you went to a Disney park and who you were with and why. And probably realize the scent and what the weather was like and how the crowds were and what you got to go home with or what you didn't get to go home with. You know, maybe you didn't get that skull ring at the end of Pirates of the Caribbean like all the other kids did with the rubies in its eyes. Uh-huh, you were that kid. I know you were. Um, I, I was a Chippendale guy. I, I was you, a know, you know who else is a Chippendale guy? Shane Kidder, Shane's photos. I, you're the second person I've ever met that's like, love, really, Chippendale? I love Chippendale. So does he. Uh, <laughs> I make fun of him all the time uh, about it. But um, uh, I think it it's as, I don't even want to say Americana, but it's as familiar as a holiday. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it's home to a lot of people, especially in America. Uh, if you're on the East Coast, it's even grander. I mean, here we take it for granted. We just go down, we just go down the freeway, and you're at Disneyland. Uh, people who go to Walt Disney World on the East Coast, they save for years, and they're there for two or three weeks at a time. Like oh, they, God. I they was go there, crazy. I was there a little over a year ago with with my family because I'm I grew up in Massachusetts, so it was our big thing. We were, you know, every you know few years they would save up. We would drive from Massachusetts to Orlando and be there anywhere from one to two weeks. That's right. Um, you know, just so you know, you know, absorbing everything. I know exactly what you're talking about. So, uh, you know, for me, I I always uh, wanted to work for Disney in animation, mm -hmm. and w as a kid, I was never pushed to ever go to college. I was never pushed to do anything past what you're supposed to do. You know, don't flunk and don't knock anybody up and don't wreck your car and, uh, you know, all those things. Mm -hmm. I was never pushed to the arts or anything that I was interested in. I grew up kind of in a household that, you know, the arts were for sissies. So you couldn't go that way. You did, I enjoyed classical music when I realized what classical music was. They were just music beds. It's a score in a movie. That's what I thought. You know, but my my dad thought it was the worst thing on earth to be listening to a Bach piece or something from Brahm. Like, like uh, he looked at me like I was nuts. Um, uh, or we'd go out someplace to a toy or whatever. I would never go for the gun or the knife. I wanted a box of pencils or a, a ream of paper. And uh, he could never understand that. So to this day, I guarantee you, if you ask my father what I do for a living, he can't tell you. <laughs> That's the truth. And we have, and we have a decent relationship. Uh -huh. I guarantee you. When I was a kid, uh, in the earliest of days, I was his. His thing to me always is, "What the fuck is Mickey Mouse ever going to do for you?" That's the truth. I'll tell a quick story. Uh, again, this isn't ego driven or anything. Uh, one of my first jobs at Disney uh, when I was there, I was what's called a VIP host. So if you've ever been to a Disney park, uh, you've seen the the girls and guys in plaid. Mm -hmm. and they're usually walking with celebrities. Um, I did that. And 
I had many famous repeat guests, many, 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 in the hundreds, uh, dignitaries, royalty, uh, government officials, and high-profile people, sports figures, movie stars, television stars, recording stars, whatever. And one of them happened to be Nicolas Cage. And uh, I had Nick a few times and his family. And uh, one day, he just we were having dinner at Club 33, and he reached across the table, put his hand in mine. We were just having dinner. And he goes, oh, welcome to the family. And I just thought after all this time that I was accepted as one of them. <laughs> no. In, while the, the dessert was coming, uh, his assistant, Stephen Burris, reaches over the table and whispers into my ear, when can you put your two weeks in? And I had no idea what on earth they were talking about. <laughs> um, well, it, what happens is uh, Nick owned a production company, a film production company called Saturn Films. And uh, they made lots of movies. And uh, he and I always talked about movies. And and I and I'm not a yes man. If anybody knows me, I'm not a yes man. Uh, and I don't like yes men around me either. <laughs> um, but I would always be honest with him. He'd tell me about a movie or something, and I always knew foreign pictures and stuff too. So we had these great conversations, especially knowing his uncle's Francis Coppola and his, you know, who his grandfather is and who his aunt is and all that. So I really couldn't mess that up. <laughs> I knew I knew he came from good stock. Um, but he always appreciated the directions that I came from when it came to when it when it when it involved film production and mostly story. So uh, he hired me to be a development executive for his film company, and I had no experience. Um, and I remember I didn't tell my parents this at all. I left Disney, and I moved out here to Hollywood, and. Uh, I showed up to work in my first week there. I worked on a lot of scripts and treatments and coverage and all this stuff and got my first check. And it was like, I want to say $3,000 or something. And I just remember that Friday or that Saturday morning, I jumped in my car and drove to my parents' house and sat there and just bullshitted with my folks. And I looked at my dad and I said, this is what the fuck Mickey Mouse is going to do for me. And because of Mickey... I've I everything I have and have done all stems from Mickey Mouse. And it's not the character that most people, the entertainment piece or the four foot mouse at the parks, nothing like that. It's the ideals of what a Mickey Mouse is from the necessity of creation in 1928 to through the corporate symbol stages to you know, Academy Award winning actor, which people don't think about, um, mm -hmm. to television host on the Mickey Mouse Club, to, you know, then theme park thing, to today, whatever he's supposed to be today. <laughs> I don't know what Mickey is today, but the Hello Kittiness of whatever Mickey and the, and the Fab Four are, or Fab Five are. Um, so uh, uh, that's my connection to Disney and, and why uh, I... I appreciate the company so much. Um, when it comes to other wrestlers, um, and I know an awful lot of them who are really into it, yeah, it's it's again, if they're here in California, you have to understand Disneyland's sort of a church. It's uh, it's it's a it's a it's a, it's a region. It was a regional destination until California Adventure opened. It was like Knott'sbury Farm. It was just a place to go. Um, it wasn't the multi-day hotels, resort environment, like in Florida. Right. Uh, that, that's recent. That's in the last 18, 19 years. Um, so like uh, a Candice LeRae yeah. or a Joey Ryan. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's many others. Yeah. Uh, but they go because they enjoy the attractions. They enjoy the entertainment. I go because I'm looking at crowd flow. I'm, I'm looking for the return on the dollar. I'm looking for... Uh, uh, how how a person is interacting with the attraction and with the environment, and if they really care about 1900s entertainment, you know, uh, most of the base attractions at Disney parks, not the newer ones, uh, but the dark rides and everything else, that's early 1900s technology. 
Yeah. It's that that is not advanced technology, but the entertainment and the IP is so familiar that people love it. Something that is interesting, and you can go out based off your own experience. You might say Magic Kingdom over Disneyland because you were probably younger then. Um, it hugs you when you walk in, and there is a true there is a true hug. Uh, it's a virtual hug, but it's it's there. Um, everything from the music to the cast to the cash registers, like everything is in sync and it works. Um, and you usually forget that you're in a business, mm -hmm. you know? And that's one thing that I think the public always gets wrong when they talk about Disney, uh, especially the Disney parks. Uh, it's a luxury, it's not a right. Mm -hmm. And with, with annual passes and being able to pay on time, I feel that it has changed the mindset to how a Disney park is perceived today. But a lot of younger people, uh, like the Candace LeRae's of the world, the, you know, early early 30s, they grew up with a different Disneyland than I grew up with. Um, you just couldn't walk down there. And you went maybe once or twice a year, much like you, every other, every third year you go for Christmas or your birthday or something like that. It had to be a special occasion. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so we're we're almost out of time, but oh, I want... add thirty minutes. <laughs> well, no, I, I got a whole pot of coffee. Sure. I got I'm... a lot of shit to talk. Come on. <laughs> oh no, I trust me. I know I can I can literally talk with you for days, and um, we need to set up another day where we're just sitting with whiskey and we're just talking about sure. different things. Uh, but I, I wanted I wanted real quick to get. Um, See, Joe Galley's Emmy doesn't have a balloon there there hanging off it. Mine and, does. And you got two of them. I do. Yeah, I, I know. You, you. As soon as Joe's episode aired, you're just like, by the way, I got double the Emmys that he <laughs> That's not a humble brag at all. Uh, <laughs> um, I wanted to get, I wanted to get, um, like, if you had, like, brief words of advice for different roles in wrestling that are trying to get positions on televised programs since you obviously are you know overseeing them all over the country and not just with the wrestlers per se but you know like if you had like one sound piece of advice per se the ring announcer the referee the cameraman um you know like just something to help them really get comfortable once they reach that type of uh, stage the biggest thing I mean, you've met me, you know, it's, it's be, it's be yourself. Um, be you, if you're awkward, be awkward. If you're, you know, if you, if you have a lot of, uh, uh, uh of ego, which is in our business, you can have that, um, uh, show it. Uh, it's, it's so difficult anymore because look, just to be honest, like when I came in, Everyone was on steroids and everyone was on coke. Right. And everyone was just like music, you know, everybody was just balls to the wall, amped. And that's why you got those larger than life characters people talk about, because they had a lot of courage, <laughs> artificial <laughs> courage into allowing them to perform that way. Mm -hmm. Well, here we are 40 years later, let's say, and the talent today, uh, whether they're younger or whatever, they just don't know who they are as people. And they're not open for the most part with themselves to, to allow themselves to be themselves. So just be yourself. Uh, we'll figure out how to make it work if you're the right person for the role. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, I get a lot of heat for being honest uh, with people. Uh, I really try to encourage and educate and try to get people to go. Uh, there's people in the area who, uh, you know, television is an aesthetic uh, visual medium. And I try to help whether it's uh, facial hair or tattoos or whatever, and try to explain to them why that might not be the smartest thing right now in their career in the earliest stages. It's like, look, you need to do this and you need to do this and you need to create an image and you need to, you know, show that you're you're willing to be produced. I feel much going back to what I said earlier about the United Wrestling Network, 
that talent is has just fallen into this independent wrestling mindset of uh, this is who I am, this is what I am, take it or leave it. I'm not going to allow you because you have this thing to tell me what to do. And in reality, they really need to open up and allow that cooperation because with real wrestling, corporate wrestling, network television wrestling, you will not be able to do anything you feel that you are in independent wrestling. I usually like to say regional wrestling or area wrestling. I hate the word independent wrestling. I just can't stand it. Uh, why, why put another something on a thing that the majority of the public doesn't understand to begin with? They know what pro wrestling is. Why you say independent? Like, what's that? What's independent wrestling? I don't get it. Um, so, and that's not me just trying to sound old or whatever. It's just reality. Uh, I understand why there's independent wrestling. Tarantino was coming out movies. They came out with independent uh, film. And all of a sudden, it's independent wrestling. It used to be just the circuit, the loop, the this, the that, the region, the territory. I get it. But that's 25 years ago. Okay, that's time to go away now. I don't think people look at independent film because they realize that it's Disney and it's it's Sony and it's Universal and it's somebody always deep down who has the money. They just slapped a nice sticker on it and sold it to you as independent. Mm-hmm. NXT was supposed to be even independent, but the, the, you know where the money came from. Right. So, so I hope that answered your question. Just be yourself. And, um, you know, I just don't care for... I don't like phonies mm. in, in, in a phony business, which is funny. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I don't like phonies. Uh, I want you to be true. And uh, also don't be afraid to ask questions and state your opinion. Um, there's an awful lot of uh, people out there that I hear from now who just say, I don't want to use the telephone. Like, I don't want to talk on the phone. It's, you know, I'll text or I'll email, which I don't understand. Again, I'm not from that generation, uh, but verbal communication is way better than any type of written communication, especially when most people don't know how to write. It's, it's amazing how often I might, you know, send a text or an email to something to someone, whether it was personally for work reasons, whatever it may be. And all of a sudden, like, I'll get a call. Like, what did you mean by that? I'm like, what do you mean? What I mean, like, it was, it's because it's always how you read it. You're imagining the tone where obviously. Yeah, that's how you interpret it, for sure. Yeah. So if you're on the phone, you know, you know, if, 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 I, if I was saying to you, it was just like, you know, I, you know, honest, I, don't, I don't think this project is going to work. Where if in an email, I don't think this project is going to work. You're going to get a different reaction. Yeah, it's like, why are you being a dick? Right. Let it, let it play out. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so I have a lot of that. And another thing, too, again, I come from a different generation. So uh, I look at things through different eyes. And in today's world, uh, younger people might consider it being off color or racist or um, a different tone when, in fact, it's not. Uh, so there's a lot of that kind of uh, differences where you do have to talk about things. Um, uh, I didn't grow up with, and this isn't a slide, but I didn't grow up with people who have, who's a different gender. Mm-hmm. I just, that wasn't, that's new to me. Um, uh, not that I have anything against it. It's just, that's new to me. And so when you're in conversations with someone or you're trying to come up with something for someone Uh, in a story, a character, whatever, and they want to bring their real tones into things, at times, who they are doesn't work for the role. You know? So you you have to come up with a compromise uh, to make it work. And today, it's extremely difficult because, again, with social media, these people have a direct audience that they don't feel they need a promoter for anymore. Mm. They could do it themselves and probably be more successful at it, to be honest with you. It's just that I have a television show and I'm not just a live event. On a live event, I get it. You can be a unicorn. I totally get it. 
But on television for 52 weeks out of the year, uh, being a unicorn might not work. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I, I agree with you on that. And I mean, you know, I, I could, like I said, I could, I could pick your brain for hours and days on it. Uh, but I, I know we, sh- we should we should get this wrapped up. We can always pick this up for an, another episode, no doubt about it. But Dave, how can people watch you, whether it's with NWA Power, Champ Shores, Hollywood, how do they keep informed with everything going on with the United Wrestling Network? And how do they just talk to you? Uh, real simple. Send me a text and I'll even talk to you. 818-300-6328. Um, send a text. If I'm available, I'll be happy to talk if I can. Uh, uh, I'm serious. It, it kills me. Uh, once again, 818-300-6328. Um, but uh, I'm easy to find social media. Uh, I'm at CWFH Marquez in most places. Uh, not this call. Uh, uh, on, Holly, on Hollywood um, or on uh, the NWA it's at NWA or National Wrestling Alliance uh, dot com, uh, Hollywood Wrestling dot com. Um, and, uh, you know, we're trying. It's a it's a it's a it's a very interesting time, uh, not to be cliche, but it, it's a very interesting time at the moment to see society and uh, entertainment and medicine and all of this stuff being smashed together at once, creating a an amazing confusion. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I I just hope that you know that everybody realizes their world, and I hope they're taking this time off that we all have to realize who they are as people, and um, and you know, do your best to love each other and be nice, uh, which is I know easier said than done. And I, I, I couldn't agree more with that, Dave. Thank you so much for being on the show. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Josh underscore Tariff. Please like, share, subscribe, uh, share this interview, subscribe to the page. New interviews up every Tuesday. Uh, once again, the mastermind, Dave Marquez. <laughs> Don't say it that, like that. That's bad. The, well, I, I'll, I'll type it, the mastermind. Then you'll take it for hours. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> Thanks so much, Dave. Thank you.